Hello and welcome to OLA 2020. Thank you so much for joining us in this session on looking for an instance of a work, BibFrame. My name is Elizabeth Skirpin Estes. I am this year's chair of the Technical Services Roundtable and I'm so happy to moderate this session. I'm joined by our session's presenters, presenter, excuse me, Tom Steele. Thomas Steele prefers to use the nomen string Tom. He was born and raised in Tulsa and started out at Oklahoma State University Libraries as a copy cataloger, but wound up joining the OU faculty cataloging for engineering, geology, chemistry and math, and life sciences. He's cataloged more maps than Indiana Jones has seen. Tom lives in Norman with his wife, two cats, and two dogs. I'll be back at the end of the session with some questions for Tom, but right now I want to turn it over to Tom. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, full disclosure, this is my second time running through this thing because we've having problems recording these things for Zoom, and I hope you all enjoy what we end up with. Um, and I hope I'll cover everything I covered last time, but um, if I forget something and you have any questions, my contact can be at the end. And there goes my dogs. Um, that would be Rollo is the lower pitch bike and Jelly Beans the higher pitched one, and they're a Chihuahua and a Chihuahua, respectively. I can't really do anything about that. <laughs> they are guard dogs. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the presentation is called Looking for an Instance of a Work, BibFrame. It is based on my article, What Comes Next? Understanding BibFrame. But so what I'm gonna cover in this is first, I'm going to give a background on why do we need BibFrame? What's wrong with Mark? And, I'm, and hopefully most of you who have enough experience with Mark, that you can kind of answer some of those questions. Um, then we're going to talk about concepts that BibFrame uses that are that it helps to understand. And finally, then I'm going to take you to the BibFrame sites, and I'm going to show you how to create a record in BibFrame and how to use the Mark conversion tools, and or at least how to look at a Mark record. I'm not going to actually go through how to convert your Mark records to BibFrame. I'm just going to show you. A converted record so you can as a comparison in a, uh, a viewer that you can use that can help you understand uh, the differences. Um, anyway, so um, the Library of Cong, I mean the OCLC in 2015 printed their last ship of catalog cards and OCLC's president and CEO Skip Pritchard joked we were going to have a monk doing calligraphy on the last card as an idea to let you know, well, the card catalog's been around forever. It's about time we just let it go. Because people these days, when they look things up, they're used to using Google, not a card catalog. And yet our online catalogs still kind of reflect a card catalog more than um, what people expect to get all these. Um, when you look something up on Google now, you get related info and you get a little, you know, you get that data card that tells you some things about what you looked up, especially if you're looking up a book or an album or something and then it has related stuff. So how are libraries going to do that? And, and that's what uh, BibFrame is kind of intended to do. That to, um, In 2012, Library of Congress um, got together with Zafera and they began to work on BibFrame. So, one of the earliest critics of Mark was Roy Tennant in 2002, he wrote, Mark Must Die. And like he said, he pointed out, um, the Mark record was kind of invented to, by Henrietta Evram in the 60s to turn a index card into a long string of characters for the computer to read. And so a Mark record is relatively small, but, uh, um, because they had, but nowadays with terabytes and all, you know, data is ubiquitous and cheap. So we need to be able to store more info in a record than we currently do. Um, Mark was card based. Um, people are preferring screen based info now. And Mark was proprietary to libraries and library software vendors. So that made it rather libraries were kind of stuck in their little silos. So Tennant, he, he suggested that in the future, we, we should have a, a standard that is versatile, extensible, open, transparent, 
modular hierarchical granular and cooperative. Now, I'm not going to go into each one of what each of those things mean, but um, but yeah, we're kind of looking for something quite a lot different than Mark, and hopefully, because Bibframe um, is can be expressed in RDF and encoded XML, is more able to meet these requirements. But okay, before we go into Bibframe, let's talk about two developments that happen in information science that in cataloging and and all that in order uh, that is helpful for understanding how Bibframe works. Well, first, in um, 2006, Tim Berners-Lee started preaching we need to use linked data, and that's kind of the the web, the new form of the web. He he invented the World Wide Web in the 90s, or and and now he's saying, well, let's get linked data so computers can understand all this information and tie it together and use it to recommend or or help and to sort things better. And he had four roles of linked data, and that's one, we use uniform resource identifiers to name things. And then the URIs should be in HTTP formats, so they can be looked up. And we need to use standards such as RDF to provide useful information. And then this RDF also would have an ontologies and, and stuff like that that gives that kind of defines what these what this data is. And then allow users to discover more things by linking more URIs. So really he wants to envision the World War Web to be more URIs with relationships with each other. So we can actually understand what these records, which were records are related to which records. And meanwhile, um, in 1997, the uh, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, known as IFLA, introduced the functional requirements for a bibliographic record. And I'm sure most of you catalogers have heard of Ferber by now. And Ferber, this is a model of how to look at records and what do we need for a bibliographic record and what it should entail. And, and so basically, um, Ferber came up with these entities, uh, the parts of a record and, and what they are, and, and they put them in groups. So group one are the objects that are being cataloged for the bibliographic record. And they're the work, expression, manifestation, item. And say a work would be like um, Shakespeare, when Shakespeare comes up with the idea for the play Hamlet. And so then he writes it down as a play, and that's the expression. And then you take that expression, and let's say you like make a 1992 um, paperback, trade paperback of Hamlet, and that's the manifestation. And then you take one copy of that manifestation and that's your item. Then group two would be the persons, the families, the corporate bodies that you know create these works, express manifestations of items. And then the group three are the concepts, objects, events, place that these work group one entities are about. Now group one also could be about group two entities and, and so forth, but that's, that's kind of the difference between group two and group three. Group two are, are actually active organizations or people and everything that can actually do things. Well, the rest of group three are just um, kind of ideas. Um, so Bibframe decided to take this WIMI model and that's what the whole, whole thing about um, Bibframe is. And originally they had work instance authority annotation. I'm not going to go too deep into that because after the big frame pilot project phase one, they decided, no, that's not going to work. So instead they replaced it with work instant item. And now work and expression are combined together in big frame um, to be a work. And I kind of, I couldn't ever find out the reasoning behind this. I looked it up and everything. And as best as I can tell, it's just the idea that um, it's just simpler to understand a work as the things that the, like the title and the sub, the subjects and the author, those third things have to do with the work. And then when it's expressed in one particular instance, 
than you know the publisher and everything. And we'll see the the bib frame model later. But I I believe they just combine work and expression together because libraries and other institutions that are going to use bib frame are really just more con concerned about the expression of the work instead of just the whole idea of the work. Um, in 2017, um, Ferber was followed up by, well, okay, before that, Ferber was created just to cover the work expression manifestation item. They didn't came out, IFLA didn't came out with FRAD and FRSAD, which is functional requirements of authority data and functional requirements of subject authority data to cover group two and group three entities. Well, in, by 2017, they go, well, this is too much to follow and everything. So we need to just get one model instead of three models. And so LR, LRM combined three together. And there are some differences, but which I won't go into today because BitFrame just really focuses on the work instance and item part. And not the whole res, nomen, and all the things that LRM introduced. Okay, so link data is based on the R, the, on the triplets or the RDF triplet, triple. Um, and the RDF triple, it, it consists of a subject, a predicate, and an object. And in Mark, Mark I, I, you can, if you take a Mark record and you translate it into RDF triples and say, okay, so the Mark record is the subject, the 100 field is the predicate, which means 100, um, which is like the creator of the record, and then the object would be like William Shakespeare. And the thing is, then you can define the subject and the predicate as URI, so you have a URI for your, your, your record that you're creating. You have a URI for your vocabulary you're using, like the title, author, creator, um, all the all the things that can, or or a subject or an event or you know any of these relationships an item can have with another that becomes your predicate and then you create an ontology and that defines all these predicates and that allows the computer to understand the relationships and exactly what this means when something is related to something. Now the object can also be another URI, especially if it's like a controlled heading or a literal if the heading is not controlled, like it's just a text, like um, the statement of responsibility, that's a literal, because you don't need to control that because you're just translating, I mean, transliterating what's on the piece. Uh, uh, and our number or date, like 1999 is a literal because you don't need to control 1999, because, um, you know, the computer already understands what that number means. It just so, oh, it's a year, and then it can organize things by year. Um, okay, so here's, here's another way of looking at RDF triples. It, let's say Bob can be just, just a person, and he's born on this date, and so you could, this is, you know, the predicate is for a birth date. And is a, and, you know, the predicate here is just a direct correlation here. And, or Mona Lisa was created by, so here's our, you know, creator predicate, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And here's, here's another RDF triple. This time it's, uh, we have our URIs and here's an ontology for music group. And is, uh, here's what the, that means type. So, you know, or it, that's the syntax here for what is a uh, means. And Spoon, here's our record in, on DBpedia, you got Spoon. And then is name, this is what a name is. And then here for a literal, you can just put this uh, band, the band name is Spoon. Um, okay, so now we are finally ready to actually look at BibFrame. And here are the links we're going to use today. And I've already got them open on another tab, so we're going to leave the slide presentation for now and go to the World Wide Web. Okay. So here we have the Library of Congress uh, BibFrame website that here lists their vocabulary, some examples and notes, and some papers. And 
Here you can see a report on the phase one pilot project, which ended in March of 2016. And so they made some changes and came up with bid frame 2.0. And in 2017, they began the second pilot project. And important here is the bid frame model. And here they have the definitions of a work and instance and item and what agents and subjects and events are. And it says, yeah, the bid frame vocabulary consists of RDF classes and properties. Classes include the three core classes listed above as well as various additional classes. So the core class work instance item, many of which are subclasses of the core classes. Properties describe characteristics of the resource being described as well as relationships among resources. For example, one work might be a translation of another work. An instance may be an instance of a particular bib frame work. Other properties describe attributes of works and instances. For example, the bid frame property subject expresses an important attribute of a work, what the work is about, and the property extent expresses an attribute of an instance. Okay, so that's a lot. But okay, so let's put this simple. Um, the work I'm going to go through first is uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda's uh, Hamilton, which is coming out on Disney Plus uh, next Friday. Um, well, I'm sure by the time you see this, it's already out. So not to plug or anything, but it's one of my favorite musicals ever. So um, so your agent, that's the creator of the work, is uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda. And the subject is Alexander Hamilton. And that applies to the work. And the event is like uh, the assassination of Alexander Hamilton by Aaron Burr. Um, sorry, spoilers. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, so you have the instance, and the instance could be a two CD soundtrack and published by whatever record company that is. We can look at the record here. So that's uh, uh, Atlantic Recording Corporation. And let's go back to the model. So here's the publisher. The format would be the CD. And then item would just be an individual the library's copy of that. So you got held by University of Oklahoma Libraries and here's the barcode. So as you can see, that's how the different properties apply to the work, the instance and the item. Um, of course, in Mark, we had this, we had the biblical record, bibliographic record was often the work and the instance together and then the holdings and info and all that were on the item. So the Mark record is quite a different way of looking at it. Um, a lot of the properties on a work in an instance are both on the bib record and mark. And here we are, here's the ontology used for bib frame. And you can either view it by list and see, then you can like check on LC, see a library, yeah, LCCN, the Library con Congress control number. And it's a subclass of identifier. And so an identifier is a token or name associated with a resource, such as a URI or an ISBN. And here's all the different kind of identifiers you can use. And so the computer now uses this. I, I, uh, the computer now has with this ontology, it now knows that anything that is uh, ANSI is also an identifier. And so it, it allows the computer to understand better what these these uh, properties, actually, these classes and properties mean. Okay, you can also view it by class, I mean, uh, or by category, and by extension. So you hear the classes, and here are the properties for, and, and, and for different categories here. So here, So it's a rather large vocabulary. And you're like, okay, how am I going to be able to remember all this? Well, yeah, Library of Congress has created a bib frame editor. I'm sure that the vendors are going to come up with their own editors. We'll see. So just like you now have an editor to work in Mark, you'll have an editor to work in bib frame. However, unlike Mark, um, you don't, you aren't, you're not going to actually have to know all the XML and RDF tags and everything. You just go here, you create the resource, and 
and let's say, okay, so let's start with the Lin Manuel Miranda CD, and we're going to make the work. And see, instead of all these mark tags and everything, you have the the name. So, create a rework. Well, what's a create a rework? You click on it, and it'll take you to the RDA toolkit. And let's go ahead and log in here. And this is instructions for how you record a creator. And so, so we're going to take the primary creator, and when Manuel Miranda is a person, and we look him up in the name authority file, and here we go. And then we can add him there, or you can edit it and change it. And let's say you just put in somebody, let's say Hamilton Alexander. And yeah. Oh, look at all these different Alexander Hamiltons. Or you put that. Or you can just delete it, but let's go with Miranda. And see, I don't know. We don't need it. Save the changes. And now you got an URI here for his name. I go, well, and then put the mark related terms here the composer. Save that, and then we add another one. Reddest. And see there you can just, in a form of work, put a musical. Uh, data work, 2015. Okay, so subject of the work, um, let's do like Hamilton, Alexander. Um, and this is, oh, it's in, it's not a subject, it's in the LCNAF, so you find it in the LCNAF, and then you've added it here. And it's like perform music language, English. So preview that, and here is what we've got so far. And uh, here it is first, I think this is, uh, yeah, Turtle, and here's the JSON, JSON link data. So, so already um, our um, bit frame can be serialized in many formats. You got JSON, you got RDF, XML, you got Turtle. Those are the three that the uh, Library of Congress has been working with. I'm not even sure what this does here. I guess these are the links I've created. Yeah, there's the language, RDA conventions, PCC. So yeah, some of these are automatically created from the template. Um, so now you can go create the audio CD, then you want to do things that relate to the instance. And so you go to instance, and then here you would link, link it to the work, or you can just go ahead and create the work here. Um, do all that again. Let's see. So then all this stuff for the work will be in there. Um, you can put in the instance title. Um, Hamilton originally. Uh, Hamilton. Let's see, where's the... Hamilton and see when it has that you want to hit the plus. Uh, and I guess original odd play cast recording. I believe that's what it said. I can hit plus and then see. 
um, statement of responsibility. Uh, so let's see. You have to, let's look at the OCLC one. Um, yeah, book music and lyrics by Lynn Manuel Miranda. So then you just put that in. I'm using a mark record instead of the actual physical copy because it's just easier because I don't want to use a camera and all that. So you just put that in and then you got your statement of responsibility. But you don't even need the, you don't even need the, the mark record to do this. I mean, you can do all this just from your cataloging experience and what you know about creating a catalog record. And let's preview that and see here it is. Here's the serializations in that again. And then another tool we can use here is, let's go back to the big frame page and go to the home page. Um, Here's the big frame homepage. You can here you can look up uh, what's new, and they got um, they had an update at midwinter, and you can get information here. Uh, Ifla gave a presentation on big frame with RDA. I believe some of the latest things that are happening is um, Ex Libris has gotten on board with creating a big frame um, conversion tools and all that. Um, Several research libraries are experimenting in BibFrame. And here's the Mark to BibFrame comparison viewer. And here we can put in the LCCN for the record we just worked on. Oh, see, uh, see, I see site going, you need to go away. Um, Okay, so here's the mark record, and here's the turtle serialization. I'm, I'm a bigger fan of RDFXML, so we'll do that. Um, now, when you put in a mark, it, so here's the mark XML here, and here's the bib frame XML. Okay, and so that's Hamilton. Um, This is the record. Oh, that's sort of off the right. Okay, so the next record I wanted to look at is um, many, many years ago when I was a copy cataloger at um, Oklahoma State University. Uh, Roscoe Rouse came and spoke or something, and he gave me a copy of his book that he wrote about the history of the, uh, the library. And so let's look at that. And there's actually an online version of it. So here's the book. Um, If we had more time, what I could do is go search through here and I can find that picture of uh, Ko Ming Chan, who was my boss, first boss at Oklahoma State University. She ran the cataloging department when I uh, started there. And she's, there's a picture of her in this book, but okay. But what we're wanting to do is we're actually gonna catalog it. Okay. So let's go back to bib frame. going to create a resource and let's start with a monograph and an instance and as you can see here we can create the work here by okay so the creator the, the work here is uh, this is probably what you're going to be doing for most of the things you have because this is if you don't have if it's a first edition you're going to create the work and instance at the same time if it's the second edition you're going to call up the work and then create the second edition 
And so Roscoe Rouse, um, and then he's the author. Uh, I did that wrong, okay. Select it, and then yeah, save changes. You gotta make sure that it comes down here and once again, pencil it, edit, trash can to delete it. Uh, work title is, so we wanna go to the title page. A History of the Oklahoma State University Library by Roscoe Rouse, Jr. Did I, yeah, see, I keep doing this. See, what you want to do is you got to make sure to hit plus when you're done. And that's 1992. Um, and we're not going to cover it. So, so subject components. Uh, See, and then we put the it um, well so you you want to look up see then you're going to try and pick the uh, right thing here is it well let's say so you go through here and it's going to take me forever to find that so just say I found the right one um, in English So those are the things associated with the work. So you save that there, and then you got all this. And then the instance, the state of responsibility is going to be with the instance, because you know that you we've all seen that change. Um, and then you know the copyright date. And then a series statement. Once again, Centennial Book C. Once again, that's going to be based on uh, the instance because not all works are in the series. It appears see a series statement because it's a series statement is a literal. Um, it doesn't appear that the Library of Congress is setting it up for authorizing series in here. Um, but yeah, so that's some of the, that's, that's just a brief record and then we can preview it and that's what we have so far. And then, um, then we'll go back and do what I like to do with the, uh, take the LCC in. put that in our comparison viewer. And let's go ahead and do that in Turtle so we can actually see the mark record. Um, no, the title is Centennial History Series. Okay. And then see Yeah, see, it is a Columbus State University library. I'm not sure why the uh, it was not finding that one. But yeah, see, here are the different tags that get associated to it. And so let's go back to our slide presentation. 
area. See, and here's a screenshot that I, ah, I'm just trying to scroll down. Um, see, here you, here you got your creator of the work, you got your title of the work, you got the form of the work, you got the date of the work, you got the place of origin of the work. Then here's your URI that links back to the work, you got your title, you got your subtitle here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess you got it. Yeah, I know when you picked on the other tag title information, I guess I was supposed to select subtitle. Um, explicit version for the edition, so not the same as the one that's going to be on Disney. Um, and here's the serialization. And this all is in my article, What Comes Next? Understanding Bibframe. Um, hopefully my slides will be available so you can look up and find that article. Library High Tech Volume 37, number three. Um, here's the DOI. And I, in my article, I walk through the, the details of creating the Hamilton record. And here's my contact info. Uh, I have not been at that phone number since March. So just please email me. Um, that's about the only way you can reach me. I don't know when I'll be back at the office, probably sometime in August. And um, I guess we're ready for questions. Thank you. I have my headset quite on. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, and I had a couple of questions for you. And one of those being that there are some catalogers today that are bib frame skeptics. Why do you think BibFrame will be our next data standard over another possible container? Well, um, I, I just I just focused on BibFrame because that's the most information I have right now. Um, I know Link Data for Libraries is another project in the works. Um, I don't really know much about that one. I, I, I don't know for sure that BibFrame is the one that'll take over. I do think we do need a Link Data answer. And it's likely BibFrame will be it because Library of Congress is leading the way and they've gotten several libraries on board. Um, X Libraries is on board. I think OCLC has recently gotten on board. Uh, it's really what OCLC do is probably what's going to happen. And once again, I firmly believe that Mark is not going anywhere for a while and a lot of library, the larger libraries will be operating under both BibFrame and Mark or some other linked data platform in Mark and the smaller libraries will continue just use Mark, because Mark is probably fine for their purposes for now. Um, but really what we're trying to do is get linked data so our um, resources are more discoverable on the web. But yeah, I don't know, um, like in the 80s, there was the, the wars between Betamax and VHS, and Betamax, I am told, is the superior format, but VHS won out. So yeah, these things, they just go their own way. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. And where would you recommend a new cataloger or someone who's new to BibFrame who wants to learn more about it, start tackling BibFrame as they're sort of climbing that mountain of background theory and conceptual models? Well, like I, um, my article on, on uh, what comes next, understanding BibFrame, that's, the, I try to write that as an intro level. Um, I, I also had taken courses on RDF and, and the triplet and everything from Library Juice Academy, so I would look into that if you can get funding from the university. Um, the LOC BibFrame site has a lot of stuff on it, and then, of course, you're going to want to look up into uh, um, all, the, all the other major entities. The entity relationship model is a huge part of it, and... Um, so yeah, read read Ferber, read LRM. Um, the the new RDA B to toolkit covers a lot of those LRM um, entities as well. But um, I, I also would say I I personally learned a lot just from reading the intro uh, Wikipedia articles on these things because they're pretty basic. And of course, then you can go look at B um, find the sources from. Wikipedia, and then of course there's all the sources that are listed in the bibliography of my article. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for presenting at OLA 2020, Tom. 
and thank you to our attendees for joining this session. If you enjoyed this session, I would also encourage you to consider joining the Technical Services Roundtable. We provide support for technical type librarians through free and low-cost trainings, online support and camaraderie, and we'd love to have you. Please remember to complete a session evaluation in the OLA Conference app, and we hope that you'll join us for many more conference sessions.